We welcome everyone back from the closed session and for our audience, we welcome you as well. We're going to continue on with our open session. The first order of business will be item three, approval of the April 21st Pension Health Committee meeting the travel over time agenda. Move approval. Who moved that way, please? Brown. Brown. <laughs> Motion made by Ms. Brown, seconded by Mr. Miller. If you're not going to be talking, please mute your uh, microphone so we can avoid the feedback. Uh, so we're ready for a uh, roll call vote, Ms. Hopper. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, this is Pam. Yes, ma'am. We'll need to do a, a roll call for the timed agenda. Correct. I'm waiting for you to call the roll. Margaret Brown? Aye. Henry Jones? You're muted. Aye. <laughs> David Miller? Aye. Irina Ortega? Aye. Ramon Rubicava? Aye. Teresa Taylor? Uh, aye. Shonda Wesley? Aye. Karen Green Ross or Betty Yee? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did we get Ms. Taylor? Very good. Okay, moving on to agenda item four, the executive report. Mr. Mould, Mr. Sweeney, who's first? Sorry, uh, am I, I'm unmuted. Sorry about that one. <laughs> uh, why don't I go ahead and start? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Don Mould, Chief Health Director. I'd like to congratulate Mr. Fechner and Mr. Rubalcava on being selected as chair and vice chair of the committee. Our teams look forward to working with both of you again this year. Before I begin, I think it's important to recognize the crisis that we find ourselves in. Over the weekend, California crossed a distressing threshold with COVID-19. Over 1,000 California lives have been lost to COVID and more than 30,000 cases have been confirmed. The hopeful news is that in California, as you know, um, we're doing an incredible job collectively of flattening the curve. And so far, we've escaped the kind of devastation that's happening right now in places like New York. Social distancing and staying at home orders are working to ensure that our healthcare system is not overwhelmed and can continue to provide high quality care for those who need it. I have several updates for the committee. I want to begin by assuring you and our members that under our current virtual work environment, we've been able to maintain constant communication with our health plans to help ensure that our members have access to the care they need. As you know, some non-emergent procedures are currently being delayed. Elective surgeries are a prime example. All of our plans had telehealth in place before COVID-19 and through their expanded telemedicine services, our members are able to have appointments and stay in touch with their providers through phone calls, email, and video visits. If there's one th good thing that's come out of this crisis, it's that we're learning a lot about delivering telehealth. We've also been monitoring the availability of needed pharmaceuticals, working in particular with our pharmacy benefit manager, OpRx, to ensure the availability of needed prescription drugs, as well as the transition to more mail order drugs, the safest way to reserve to receive them right now. The prescription drug pipeline has been a bit of a minefield, but we aren't seeing the kind of disruption we are worried about. As I mentioned, we've been communicating with our plans daily, and they have been providing us regular updates on these and other issues. In turn, we have provided regular updates to our members on the CalPERS website, and each of the plans are regularly communicating with its members, providing updates, resources, and information. I'm proud of how our entire health team has adapted um, and evolved during this difficult time, with over 95% of our health team teleworking, taking care of themselves and their families, so they are working hard on behalf of our members. I want to say a little bit about 2021 rates and about how COVID affects them. 
This year's rate process has been enhanced because of some very good work by Marta Green and her team. We have better data, including um, comparisons based on the claims and financial data from our own data warehouse. This improves transparency and further strengthens, strengthens our rate negotiation. Were this a normal year, I'm confident that I would have been reporting that rates were looking very good and that the process was on target. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a lot of uncertainty, particularly with the timing for our health rates. Let me touch on that. One question we're asking is how COVID-19 will impact the rates currently in negotiation. The short answer is we don't know yet. No one does, but we're working hard to figure it out. Covered California recently published modeling regarding the potential impact to 2021 health plan premiums due to COVID. For the commercial market, they projected one-year costs ranging from $34 billion to $251 billion or more for testing, treatment, and care specifically related to COVID-19. They also modeled that premiums in the employer market could increase from 4 to 40 percent because of COVID and that will depend on things that we don't yet know, such as the number of people infected, how many will require hospitalization, the impacted delay to elective procedures, and the timeline for better treatment or a vaccine. We're currently reviewing other models that seek to answer some of these questions, and we're doing our own modeling to better understand the implications for CalPERS members and our contracts with the plan. Our hope is to know enough to be able to bring rates forward in June when they historically have become public and finalized. However, it may be necessary for us to alter our rate setting timeline and communication. We're having conversations with the Department of Finance and others to explore options to ensure that our rates reflect the most up-to-date information available. Like I said, as of now, we're planning to bring the 2021 premiums to you in June for approval. We'll keep you, our members, employers, and stakeholders appraised of any changes. Currently, the 2020 open enrollment period is set for September 14th through October 9th. We're not planning for delays, but are also prepared in case final rates are pushed out. In that instance, we don't expect the current timeline to move significantly. Our objective remains to provide members with all of the information and time they're used to in order to make a decision while ensuring that employers have time they need to process trans transactions. During open enrollment, members can make changes to their health plan. We will continue to provide them with tools such as their health plan statement, where they can see their premiums for 2021 based on their current health plan. Members will also be able to access their MyCalPERS account and compare health premiums across the plans available to them and look up their doctors to see which plans they participate in. I want to update the committee on our two pharmaceutical initiatives, reference-based pricing and biosimilars first. Both were scheduled, scheduled to launch on July 1st of this year. The success of these two initiatives was predicated on our ability and the ability of our two health plan partners to run communication campaigns aimed at, aimed at providers and members, informing them of changes to, um, to our prescription drug plans. The disruption of COVID-19 and the healthcare on the healthcare system and the disruption it causes our members is too great to move forward as planned. So we are postponing both initiatives until January 1st, 2021. We'll reassess in the fall, and if the healthcare system is still experiencing significant disruption, we may push the date out further. I want to mention our health competition initiative. This was on the agenda for March committee meeting and the materials um, were made on the website. We've moved that agenda item to the July offsite when we will be discussing that with you either in person or vir virtually. By way of reminder, we'll also be discussing the important topic of risk mitigation at the July offsite. A few other issues. First, I'd like to move forward um, uh, with a proposal for CalPERS to cover the cost of copays and deductibles for our members in our PPO plans through at least the end of May. This is a step our plans have already taken on the HMO side, and we think it's the right thing to do for choice, care, and select as well. Second, I want to say a little bit about surprise medical bills during this time. California has some of the most protective surprise billing laws in the country, 
but they only apply to HMO care. By way of reminder, our PPO products are self-insured, so they aren't subject to state laws. In this kind of all-hands-on-deck environment, one where retired providers are nobly returning to work and out-of-state providers have special authority to provide care in California, we are concerned about the possibility of surprise bills. We are heartened that the federal stimulus package contained language from HHS that discourages surprise bills, but we think legislation is still needed and have been working with our federal partners to convey our support. We're also working with Anthem, the third party administrator for our PPO. Anthem is monitoring its networks for arrangements that could lend themselves to surprise bills. For members, it is imperative that they continue to seek care within their network and that they contact Anthem or CalPERS if they think they have received an inappropriate bill. Lastly, today in closed session, the committee discussed competitive strategy for the long-term care program. Much of that discussion was about the potential need to reduce the discount rate for the long-term care fund in light of recent returns of fixed income investments, the long-term care fund's primary holding. Such a reduction would, unfortunately, require significant premium increases. Management is continuing to evaluate this and related issues and we'll come back in open session in June with a full presentation. It is important to note that the LTC fund and its discount rate are totally separate from the CalPERS pension fund. That concludes my opening remarks. I'm happy to take questions um, either now or I can wait until after Anthony has done his presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Mould. I, I, in my opinion, I think it's under your delegated authority, but the part about your co-pays moving forward, um, covering that through May, I think that'll just be, without objection, the direction of the chair uh, that gives you the benefit to move on with that. So thank you very much for bringing that forward. Uh, before we move to Mr. Sweeney, I do have a uh, point of personal privilege for Mr. Rubalcaba. Rubalcaba, you wanted to speak, please? Uh, yes, thank you. And, and first, uh, let me congratulate uh, Ms., uh, the chair, Mr. Rafik, for his reelection. And more importantly, thank you for expressing the will of the committee uh, by moving forward that um, there should be no uh, co-pays and uh, cost of treatment for uh, for treatment in this uh, crisis. So thank you for that. Uh, yes, thank you for um, allowing me to speak. I wanted uh, to thank Mr. Uh, Don Moulds and all his staff. Uh, Anthony, Robert, and everybody else for their help in uh, ensuring that there was uh, a smooth transition in the open enrollment for the county of Riverside into CalPERS. So it took a lot of effort, the tight, very tight um, schedule, and I appreciate the, the support of, of CalPERS staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubacaba. And thank you, Mr. Moles and your team. Mr. Sweeney, you look like a pilot. You're up, sir. <laughs> yeah, forgive me for the headset. I just didn't want anything to go wrong. So we appreciate that. I'm, I'm deferring to the headset to ensure that. So uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Anthony Sweeney, CalPERS team member. And I'd also like to congratulate Mr. Fechner and Mr. Rubakava on their appointments and look forward to our continued relationship going forward. Uh, I'd like to begin my remarks by acknowledging this is the first time I'm able to meet with you since assuming my role as customer services and support teams deputy executive officer. And I'm extremely honored to be the successor to Don alum and the great foundation she built with this amazing team and outstanding service to our customers. I'm also excited to move forward and build upon those successes and I'm proud to serve this great organization in this capacity and grateful to Marcy and the board for this opportunity and your continued support. It's been a few months since we've met, so seems like ancient history, but I wanted to give a recap of the CalPERS benefit education events that we have held this year. We successfully kicked off our 2020 schedule with two well attended events, one in Rohnert Park in January and another in San Luis Obispo in February. These events included some new resources we had rolled out to our attendees to make them even better. Uh, we had new learning guides that alleviated the members from having extensive note-taking. 
Uh, we implemented QR codes that attendees could easily access electronic resources. And we had a pre-attendance checklist to help our attendees make the most of events of the events by uh, highlighting things that they would need when they were at the events. So we, we continue to have high satisfaction ratings for these events of 96%. And they've been a huge success and are highly valued by our members. And I'd like to thank both board member Perez and board member Fechner for making the time to connect with the attendees at these events uh, in January and February. And the feedback from our members is they really appreciate the FaceTime with our board members. Uh, with that said, in March, we started talking about the implications of COVID-19 situation on our customer services and made the difficult decision to postpone our CBs through the end of June. So we'll continue to evaluate the situation and those scheduled for the remainder of the year. So with that, I'd like to move a little bit to uh, an update on recent events as they pertain to services and support we provide to our members and employers. Uh, when March began, 100% of the nearly 900 team members in CSS worked on premise in an office setting. And as the COVID-19 situation emerged, we met diligently with team members and leaders for options to transition to more remote services. We, we quickly yet thoughtfully made decisions on a variety of customer services, ranging from office closures, cancellation of in-person customer education, and began tr transitioning to phone and video appointments and web-based training efforts wherever possible. This significant effort included workload management activities to ensure all mission critical functions were effectively planned and organized with as minimal impact as possible to members and employers, while at the same time leading and supporting our team members living and working throughout the state. I'm amazed and proud at how quickly we were able to transition most of our team to telework maximizing their safety and also those that remained at the office. Additionally, I am happy to report our most critical business processes, including benefit payments, are performing at an extremely high service level. I attribute this to having a high performing, deeply committed and fully engaged team that adapts well to new circumstances and technology. As a result, we've achieved more than I ever thought possible. Currently, more than 80% of our CSS team, including the contact center, is working remotely from home. It's been an incredible effort, and I'd like to thank our partners across the organization for enabling successful continuity of service during such a trying time. And this concludes my report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Sweeney, and I do want to, uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, just reach out to all of our staff, starting with Ms. Frost, all the way down for the magnificent job you guys have all done in transitioning during this terrible, terrible time we're going through. Uh, the IT staff was clearly ahead of the curve. Uh, they were prepared in case something were to happen, and we certainly didn't anticipate it being this, but I think the staff has done an incredible job making sure that business is as usual. As hard as it is to say that, you all have continued to do your jobs and done, that, done them well, and it certainly is showing. I'm hearing from members out there that, geez, I sent my application in and I'm actually being retired anyway. Uh, even though we can't go have a meeting, we're able to do this either online or by mail. The staff has really stepped up and made this happen. So I want to thank all of our staff uh, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, see, see no other questions. I believe we are moving on to item five, the consent calendar. Remember I spoke earlier, we were moving 5B, the delegation. We're gonna move that to the June agenda. And when we bring that back at the same time, we bring back the investment committee delegation. So what we have is on the action consent calendar, item A, the approval of the December 17th committee meeting minutes. What's the pleasure of the committee? So move. I believe that was Ms. Taylor. Yes. 
Right, we have uh, moved by Ms. Taylor, seconded by Mr. Miller. Ms. Ms. Hopper, can you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Margaret Brown. She's her thumbs up, so I think that's a yes. Okay. Henry Jones. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Irena Ortega. Aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Karen Green Rocks for Betty Yee. Aye. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item six, the information consent items. I have uh, had no request to remove anything from that item. So we'll move on to item seven, information agenda items. 7A, the PPO health plan assessment. Ms. Marta Green, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Marta Green, CalPERS team member. I'm here to discuss the PPO health plan assessment project. The purpose of the project is to achieve long-term sustainability of the PPO basic program. As a reminder, staff and board members discussed the issues related to the high premiums in PERS care PPO basic plan during the April 2019 closed and May 2019 open and closed sessions. In the May 2019 PHBC open session, the discussion was held pertaining to agenda item 6A, which was an action item titled use of preferred provider organization plan reserves to reduce PERS care premiums. The committee approved the item and directed CalPERS staff to perform an assessment of the PPO basic portfolio and to make recommendations to the board's consideration to improve the stability of the portfolio. Uh, this project is the result of that direction. Today, I'll discuss the recent history of the PPO basic program, describe the project design and timeline, and the key findings from the first phase of the project. So by way of background, in 2014, CalPERS began risk-adjusting risk health premiums within the PPO basic program. When risk adjustment was re removed at the beginning of the 2019 plan year, PPO basic premiums were significantly impacted. The PERS care basic premium experienced a 38% rate increase, and the PERS select basic plan premium decreased by 26%. The PERS choice basic premium increased by a more modest 6%. However, the premium buy-down I mentioned earlier mitigated the sharp premium increase in PERS Care Basic for 2019 and 2020 plan years. The buy-down used a total of 90 million using excess PPO reserve fund, which reduced the premium increase to 20% in 2019 and reduced what would have been a 21% increase in 2020 to 6%. These significant year-over-year -year premium increases and the PERS care basic are a result of adverse selection. When unhealthy lives concentrate in a plan, driving up premiums and driving out healthy lives. There are many reasons a plan may experience adverse selection. It may be due to benefit design, service area, provider network, or a combination of all of those factors. CalPERS launched the PPO assessment project to understand the cause of adverse selection in the PPO basic program. The goal of the project is to achieve long-term sustainability of the PPO basic health plans, reduce year-over-year -year premium volatility, stabilize the plan populations while minimizing member disruption. The project consists of four phases. Phase one, data analysis. Phase two, stakeholder outreach. Phase three, benefit design modeling. And phase four, implementation. So the first phase, data analysis uh, of the project was conducted by the CalPERS health actuarial team. The team looked at historical premiums, enrollment, member migration patterns, healthcare cost trends, and benefit and network differences among the three basic plans. The member migration enrollment analyses affirmed that members with higher medical needs have historically migrated out of PERS cho choice basic and PERS select basic and into PERS care basic. And members with lower medical needs historically, historically migrated out of PERS care and PERS choice to PERS select. In other words, members who don't need a lot of care migrate or stay within a plan with the least rich benefit design and narrower network for select, and members who, consider, who need considerably more care migrate to or stay within the plan with the richest benefit design and network for care. 
that members are choosing their plan based on network and benefit design and correlation with their health status affirms that the PPO basic premiums are being impacted by adverse selection. The increased concentration of high utilization members in PERS Care Basic necessitates large annual uh, premium increases to accommodate the higher medical and pharma pharmacy costs for the plan. Likewise, the increased concentration of low utilization members in PERS Select causes the annual premium to be lower than the value of the plan based on the benefits and network offered to its members. So to put this into perspective, if members' risks did not influence plan premiums, the 2020 single party premium in PERS Care Basic would be $788. Instead, without premium spend down, the PERS Care premium is 1,123 for a single subscriber. The additional $335 in premium is the result of high risk members grouping into PERS Care Basic. Likewise, if members' risk did not influence plan premiums, the 2020 single party premium of the PERS Select Basic plan would be $677. Instead, the 2020 PERS Select single party premium is 492. Because low risk members group into this plan, they pay $185 less than the plan is worth based on its benefit structure and available network. With continued adverse selection, the team anticipates that first care basic plan premium will continue to experience high annual premium increases, while the per select basic plan premium will be priced much lower than the actual benefit design and network value. The PPO Medicare supplemental plans do not experience the effects of adverse selection, largely because the federal government funds the majority of the cost of the care through the Medicare program. So the second phase, stakeholder outreach, began with a stakeholder engagement forum that was held in January of this year. The project team discussed preliminary findings from the analysis phase with the stakeholders and asked stakeholder leaders to encourage their members to respond to the coming survey. This survey was designed to learn from basic members what factors they consider when they select a new health plan during open enrollment or why they choose to remain in their current plan. Patterns that emerge from basic members' responses will be used during phase three of the project when the project team will consider potential plan redesigns for the PPO basic program. In February, the survey was distributed to a randomly selected pool of 3,000 members in each of the three PPO basic plans. The responses were collected through the online survey platform SurveyMonkey, the links to which were delivered to the selected members via email as well as postal mail. The CalPERS team is currently analyzing the responses to the survey and intend to have results by the end of this month. In addition to the survey, the team is conducting a literature review to understand how large group plan purchasers in this market have addressed the adverse selection in their programs. So the next phase will be phase three, where we will uh, uh, take the findings from phase one and phase two and use them to design and model alternative designs for the PPO health plans. The, the team will model a variety of options, including maintaining the status quo, implementing risk mitigation strategies for the PPO basic products, combining choice basic and care basic, or some combination of all of these as pot potential solutions. Alternative design options will be presented to the board in September of 2020, with final designs presented to the board in November of 2020 for approval. Phase four implementation will be the final phase um, of the project and any approved changes uh, will be reflected in the 2022 rate development process. That concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Very good, thank you for the presentation. I see no requests yet. Anybody still coming in with a request or question? Seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Green. Thank you. We can just do agenda item 7B, retired members cost of living report, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you again. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Anthony Sweeney, CalPERS team member. So agenda item 7B is our annual informational item update on the retiree cost of living adjustments, more routinely referred to as COLA. And our retirement law provides for the payment of an annual COLA each May to all eligible retirees based on the rate of inflation as measured by the CPIU which is the consumer-based price index for all urban consumers. A retiree becomes eligible for COLA in the second calendar year of retirement. Therefore, who, members who retired last year will not yet be eligible for a COLA. 
For the year ending 2019, the rate of inflation as measured by the CPIU was 1.81%. Approximately 95% of our retirees are contracted for a 2% COLA. So those eligible will receive at least a 1.81% adjustment on this May 1 retirement check. Because of lower inflation uh, in some previous years, members who retired in certain years will receive the full 2%. We also have less than 5% of retirees who are part of employers who have contracted for a 3, 4, or 5% COLA, and they will receive at least 1.81% as well up to their contracted amount. The agenda item provides a helpful chart for retirees to determine what they should expect for a COLA increase based on their retirement date. This information has been shared with our stakeholders and is available in our newsletter and on our website for our members. With that, that concludes my comments. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I'm sure that's very good news for a lot of our retirees. A uh, question for Mr. Jones. Sure. You're muted, Henry. Henry, you're muted. <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess Jared did that for me. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Sweeney, for the report. And as usual, could you just comment briefly on the Triple P, the Purchasing Power Protection Act? Because I do know that we have uh, some of our members that retired years ago and just explain that they may get an additional bump if the data suggests so. Yeah, that's correct, Mr. Jones. Um, the Triple PA. Uh, is also it works in conjunction with the cost of living adjustments. So if the cost of living adjustments don't keep up with inflation, typically over 25, 30 years, then that purchasing power protection uh, kicks in and helps our members who have retired many, many, many years ago to retain a purchasing power in alignment with uh, what their employer contracts for. So there's about 12,000 people, uh, 12,000 of our retirees who have a uh, triple PA amount as well as their cost of living adjustments. So those help make the member whole and those have kind of fluctuated around 12 to 13,000 retirees over the last few years. Thank you very much. Thanks. Very good. So, no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Moves us to agenda item 7C, Summer of Committee uh, Direction. Mr. Mould. Yep. Other than um, informal approval of the of our um, our intent to move forward with the uh, to pay for the cost sharing related to uh, to COVID nineteen, there were no. Uh, um, no directions that I reported. All right, very good. Brings us to agenda item 7D, which is public comment. We do realize we had a few public comments for item 5B, but that was the item we pulled and postponed until June. So we move those comments now down to public comment. So, Mr. Fox, are you prepared to read the public comment into the record? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. So, first we have from Tim Barons and the subject PHBC 5B attachment 2. Tim Barons, President, California State Retirees. CSR finds that there are three proposed changes in delegation of authority opposed. Due to the nature of these proposed changes, we do not feel this item is appropriately classified as a consent item and needs full committee review and discussion. In the section with 12 listed authorities of the PHBC, proposed language strikes out in number one, CalPERS leadership in health care. Clearly the board and the PHBV should be over, excuse me, PHBC, typo, should be overseeing health care leadership. Strike out in number two, PHBC approval of providers, comma, managers, comma, administrators, and ads plan design. Approving providers is an essential responsibility for the board. 
strikeout in number 10 removes PHBC authority to oversee, quote, providers, administrators, plans, and rates, end quote, of LTC plan contracting. Given current LTC lawsuits, we again feel PHBC needs full authority over all aspects, aspects of this important program. The other changes recommended appear in line with the original intent to simplify and clarify the document. I urge the committee to send this document back as you did in yesterday's meeting. End email. From Larry Woodson. Subject, public comments on consent item 5B. I am comp commenting on consent item 5B review of PHBC delegation. First, this should not be a consent item for the same re reason changes in delegation authority for the investment committee should not have been. There are substantive changes which should be discussed by PHBC members. I have concerns with the same three proposed changes Mr. Barron's identified in his comments. Changes to the 10 listed authorities of the committee, starting with one, removing authority to set and oversee CalPERS leadership in health care. Secondly, removing authority to approve health plan providers, managers, and administrators. Lastly, removing authority to approve long-term care plan providers, administrators, plans, and rates. These are necessary and important authorities that the PHBC members should retain and carry out. Thank you. End message. In addition, uh, after Mr. Moulds spoke, Larry Woodson sent a quick email and wanted to mention Don Moulds indicated June PHBC is still the goal for approval of final rates. But in stakeholders briefing last Thursday, he and Marta Green announced that there would be a release of preliminary rates for stakeholder review prior to the PHBC meeting. The latest calendar gives no PHBC meeting in May. Will there be a special meeting called in May for release? When will we see them? Thank you. End email. Address that. You, uh, Can you, uh, Mr. Chair, would you like me to address the, the last part of that question? Yes, please. Um, so uh, we we don't intend to have a uh, a meeting a meeting between now and June. Um, if we bring back rates in June for final approval, they would be for consideration, discussion publicly, and, and action. Um, if there was a miscommunication on our part during the stakeholder briefing about about the sequencing uh, of of uh, of the subsequent meetings, uh, our apologies. I just, I also want to add on that, uh, Mr. Woodson, I, we understand your concern. Uh, rest assured that you will get the information enough time ahead of time in order to digest that before we make any decision. Uh, it may be that we don't even do the rate uh, total in, in June, uh, but you will have the information ahead of time no matter what the committee moves on to do. So I just want to make sure that uh, we alleviate your concerns or fears. Uh, that being said, <clears throat> that ends public comment. That ends today's meeting of the- uh, No, Mr. Chair? Yes? We still have two more comments for public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not know that. Please continue, Mr. Fox. Yes, Mr. Chair. So these are unrelated to any of the specific agenda items. Uh, these. Email comments come from Paul Say, and I'll try to get them both done within two minutes, or excuse me, three minutes. Uh, questions to be read at the board meeting respectfully from Paul Say. Why does CalPERS continue to use pharmacy service Optum RX that does not, does not do direct deposits of claims payments and has a nationwide filing of complaints with state agencies? The days of Caremark were better. Don't we all deserve better? Same question with Delta Dental also, who also refuses to utilize direct deposits and also has a nationwide poor record with both state and federal regulatory agencies. Isn't there something better that retirees and employees could use? Thank you for reading my question. Second, all say questions to be read at the board meeting. 
Why does CalPERS allow penalties by Delta Dental for going to non-participating providers when none exist in the area of the home of retirees, both in the U.S. as well as those living outside of the United States? This policy being in contradiction of other providers that are part of the CalPERS network where no penalties exist. The attached grievance shamefully documents the problem and requires executive action to correct this injustice for all and correction of my underpayment by health benefits. Thank you, Paul Say. And that concludes the public comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Sorry for cutting you off early. I do want to say that, that Mr. Say, someone from staff will respond to you via email uh, and hopefully alleviate some of your questions and concerns. That being said, that brings us to the end of our agenda. I want to thank my fellow committee members for a job well done. I think we had a very smooth and seamless meeting today. Thank our staff for all of the hard work, especially behind the scenes when we can't see one another. Uh, it, it went off very well. So the next committee, it will begin at two o'clock in order to give time to bring on the next set of participants and to load the uh, PowerPoints, et cetera, for the next committee. So this meeting of the Pension Health Benefits Committee is adjourned. We hope everyone stays safe. Be well. <laughs>